Okay, here we go. It's Irish breakdown time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to all Irish fans out there and anybody else who wants to stop by. This is the Irish Breakdown Podcast. I'm Vince D'Addario. I am the football analyst here at irishbreakdown.com. That guy over there, that's Brian Driscoll. He is the publisher at irishbreakdown.com. And here we are. And This is our, our normal uh, stacking up mm-hmm. episode, and we mm-hmm. are going to talk Obviously, Notre Dame's offense versus Stanford's defense, but we're also going to dive a little bit into more big picture Notre Dame offense going into this game and kind of what we're looking for from them and and what they need to show because we both, and I I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here, we both loved what happened in the last game offensively for Notre Dame. For Notre Dame, and and but was it was it a one off? Was it a unicorn on right. the schedule? Right, that's the big question moving forward. So that's kind of right. what I will set you up right there, Brian. Right, and look, I wrote an article at, at, at Irish Breakdown. I would encourage you all to read it. I, I I talk. Well, I mean, you should always read the articles. It helps us out and helps us grow. But the the thing I wrote about is look, there's been two completely different strong opinions I've had about Notre Dame this year on offense. The first was absolute disgust with what they tried to be in the first six games and just the frustration of, of seeing what would have worked and then actually seeing it be implemented against Florida state and then watching it disappear as they try to be something that they weren't right. But they did something midway through the season, which is they made a change, right? And Vince as a coach, you know, this Mm -hmm. philosophy right in the middle of the season is not easy. Yeah. And it rarely works. Now, it worked this time because they were transitioning into what they should have been all along. And it wasn't a completely – it wasn't like a new plays, new concepts. It was more of a, a shifting the emphasis where it should have been all along. And that was something that that I was happy to see. It also shows a, a softening of the stubbornness of Brian Kelly and Tommy Reese. Yeah, yeah. They were willing to do that as, instead of just blaming the players aren't doing this and the players aren't doing that which I felt like there was some of that going on the first half of the season, they made the change. And we've seen it steadily get better and better and better each week. And when they've actually, uh, you know, there's been times we haven't seen it, you know, the first half, the first quarter against Navy, we saw it second half against Virginia, but those were both instances where it was more of a, a play calling or, you sure. know, pulling the reins in situation. When they've turned this offense loose the second half of the year, this offense has been really good. Agreed. And, and it's getting better and better and better and better each week. And so that's what makes me me think and be be optimistic that what we saw last week was sort of a culmination of what they were growing to, as opposed to just that one game where it was everything was clicking for you and everything was going wrong for the other team, which happens, right? Right. I mean, we've no seen doubt. It to good I mean Notre Dame in Miami in 2017. That's exactly what that was. If they played a week later, Notre Dame, beat, Notre Dame beats them by 20. In my, mm-hmm. but that particular day, that's what happened. Right. So as you kind of watch them grow and you see them become more of a pass-oriented team, not not pass-oriented team because they're still running a ton, but more of a building around the pass formationally with the concepts and things like that. It's made their run game better. Jack Cohn's numbers the last. I mean, he's been sneakily excellent oh. the last five games. Here's Man. Jack Cohn, especially the last four games. Here's Jack Cohn's numbers the last four games. He's completing 74.2% of his passes, 9.7 yards per attempt, and has a passer rating of 178.08. And this is what I wrote in the article. For context purposes, if those stats were his season-long numbers, he would rank third nationally in completion percentage, eighth in yards per attempt, and sixth in passer rating. And he's had seven touchdowns and one pick during that time. That's also helped Kyron Williams be better. In the last five games, Kyron Williams has gone for over 500 yards, which would put him on pace for over 1,200 yards in the regular season if that was expanded for the whole year. And he's caught 21 passes in that right. game stretch. You're seeing Michael Mayer getting hot. You're seeing Kevin Austin getting hot. Lorenzo Styles is starting to find his role. Braden Lindsay's finally being worked in. The back, I mean, it, literally everything is clicking for Notre Dame. Now, they've played bad teams. But the difference, Vince, is they're looking like what a really good offense is supposed to look like against right, teams. Right, exactly. It's not that they're just out-towning teams because we have criticized the offense for that. They just out-talented Toledo. They just out-talented Purdue. They just out-talented some teams that they beat or in the first half of the season. This is good coaching, good scheme, good execution, and being really talented. 
And and it and doesn't matter who they played. Mm-hmm. They, the, the, the the opponent is it's a faceless opponent. It, it, it that's not what we're saying. Because somebody in here, tool worker, I'll, and I'll pull it up just because it goes with what I'm saying. Unfortunately, there's only one Georgia Tech. Well, now there, there's a West Coast version of Georgia Tech too, but that well, doesn't. But matter. but again, what was the whole storyline about Georgia Tech coming into that game? All their losses had been close games. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, that was the storyline. We heard that about Navy. Well, you know, they they played Cincinnati tough and all this other kind of thing. Look, Notre Dame, if you watch, we, we said it last week, Georgia Tech's not good. We did say right. they had talent, but they're not good. They're not 55 to nothing beat down bad, though. And that's the point. And that's what we're going to find out this weekend is was it just it all kind of went right for you and not for them? Or if you do the same thing to Stanford that, that, that you did to Georgia Tech, and I'm not saying it has to be. 55 to nothing, right? It's just a dominating performance. From start then it to tells me that, okay, this is who the Notre Dame offense is, right? Right. So uh, again, that's the whole point. It's it's not about the context of the opponent. It's about the execution of the team. And that's the difference. Because with all due respect, there's not a whole lot of difference between Georgia Tech and Toledo. Right. Just that's isn't. true. That's true. And and we saw what happened with Notre Dame and Toledo. There's not a whole lot of difference between Georgia Tech and Florida State. Florida State's better, but it's not by much. And we saw what happened in that game. It, you're clearly right. seeing this Notre Dame team play and, much, much better football. And, and if you put the film on of let's, let's you just said it, Toledo. Okay. So you put the Toledo film on and you know, you show it to somebody that hasn't watched any Notre Dame football this year, and you you take away the fact that it's the same year, okay? You put on the Toledo film. You put on the Georgia Tech film, and all I'm talking about is from an offensive standpoint, play calling, play design, uh, right. motions, all of that stuff. Those are two completely different teams. Mm-hmm. And anybody that hasn't paid any attention would be like, there is no way, you know, outside of the fact that it's the same jersey numbers, that this is the same offense. Right. Okay. And, and, and what and that's, Tool Walker's saying is, is a legitimate thing to push back on it's sure. legitimate to say oh, that yeah. because this is exactly what vince and i talked about not not together publicly because we were at different places at the time but the thing late in 2019 it was they're not any better they're the same team they were at the beginning of the year same right. concepts everything it's just they're playing bad teams right which is why i wasn't impressed by that team right so i mean we do have some similar context we saw something similar to this late in 2019 they just beat up on a batch of bunch of bad teams they didn't actually look a lot better on offense than they did early in the season it was chip long did a good job of getting his players in position to make plays but the line still wasn't really any better i mean the running back position was still banged up it was the same team it was the same team the second half as it was the first half and that's the this is better than your guys scenario that we were talking about and and one thing we've all i've always credited chip long is he was always really good about here are my playmakers let me find ways to give him the ball he did that with chase late in the year he did that with Braden lindsey late in the year he did that with cole Komet late in the year and and so that's what we did not see from tommy reese beginning of the year that we are seeing now And, and that's the difference like if you went and looked at notre dame early 2019 schematically philosophically what they're trying to do they weren't a whole lot different than what they were in the second half of the year this is a different looking team and they're doing to bad teams what you're supposed to do because remember you know when when they beat boston college 40 to 7 that was an ugly game they were it was 16 to 7 in the second half and i've talked about this before aj Dillon's running screaming down right down the middle of the field open and they missed him because adi ogandiji had a sack they didn't put bc away until late you know, I, I, the Duke game, you know, Duke was just really bad. I mean, you know, so so you look at a lot of those games and, and I can talk, I can talk through a lot of those games where it wasn't as impressive as the final score showed, right? And, and like Stanford, Stanford led Notre Dame for a good chunk right. in the first half. Do you remember right. that? And that was a yes, four and eight Stanford team. Right. So it was a completely different situation. And, and I'm going back through it now. I mean, you had the Virginia Tech game. They should have lost. They played great against Navy. That was the game. They played great against Navy. That was the exception. This season, however, they're they're actually the score is not as close as the game wasn't as close as the score is dictating. That's the difference. And so I think when you look at it, it it, it does tell a different story. Now, here's why this matters. And here's why this game matters against Stanford. Because it's not just about beating Stanford. 
because they're going to beat Stanford. Correct. Okay. This is not one of those, well, anything can happen type. No, they are terrible. <laughs> they are right. awful. That's they're so beat bad. up. They're Please soft. They're not talented. The film. Just watch. They're Just bad. watch them. They're not. So good. that's, so that's not a setup to say, to dismiss what Notre Dame might do. This is more of a, we need to see Notre Dame keep doing what they're doing, which is just an absolute domination because here's yeah. what, here's why it matters, Vince. When you look at Notre Dame going into the postseason, the defense is playing elite football. And, and the metrics on defense, this is what a lot of people, this is what's kind of been funny about listening to complete people complain about Marcus Freeman all season. He had one bad game and then like a bad half at a couple places. Toledo. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then North Carolina. Second half against North Carolina was not good. But other than that, I mean, they dominated Purdue. They dominated Wisconsin. They didn't play great against Virginia Tech, but they didn't play bad against Virginia. They had like two bad plays. And then they've dominated their opponents since. If you look at Notre Dame's numbers, they're a top 10 defense when it comes to like all the efficiency numbers. They're a top 10 defense in red zone, top 10 in, in I think, third down. They're in the top 25. They're in all the top 10s in efficiency. They're 12th in scoring defense right now, giving up 18.6 points per game, which is a full point lower than what it was last season. And they're doing it against much better competition offensively than what they faced last season, in my opinion. So the, the defense is already there, right? Now it's about can the offense prove that it's capable of it? And the offense was good in wins against, like statistically, it was good yeah. against North Carolina and Navy and Virginia. It was great against Georgia Tech. If they can prove to be great again against Stanford, now all of a sudden Notre Dame is going into the postseason playing about as well on both sides of the, the ball key. as any team in the country. And that's the selling point. So yep, it's not that the they're key. beat, it's not beating Stanford. It's can you name a hotter team on both sides of the ball in Notre right. Dame? Yeah. That's the question mark. And and we talk all the time, and we talked a lot about it last night uh, on our college football playoff show, is that there's so much that is out of the control of Notre Dame. There, there, I mean, there's a ton of it, right? I mean, they need help to continue to rise. They need other teams to lose. and But this is what Notre Dame can control. They can control what Brian Kelly said at halftime, the Notre Dame standard you know, playing the way you played against Georgia Tech, playing the offensive game plan and the defensive game plan, the aggressive game plan that they had. Those are all things that Notre Dame can control. And if they just go into the Stanford game with that mindset, but like, look, whatever happens to everywhere else happens everywhere else. We lost our ability to control that when we lost to Cincinnati. It is what it is. But we have a standard that we have set for ourselves offensively and defensively. We met that standard against Georgia Tech. We need to continue that standard against Stanford. You're on. You're on mute. It was so. I gotta stop. I don't know what the heck the problem is. <laughs> it was so great to hear Brian Kelly talk about that. I at agree. Halftime, and you know, I've said I don't put a lot in what he says, but at that halftime, and he is talking to his team, and he talked about the standard, and it was like right after we had talked about it last week. Now, I am not saying that Brian Kelly was listening to our show or that someone told him that. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but it's it's it's. But that's what's needed. And again, Brian yeah. Kelly's been doing this a long time. He knows that. It's just about emphasizing that. So to hear him say that and then to watch his team go out and match that. Because again, your actions are going to speak louder than your words. And sure. when they kept going at Georgia Tech in the first half. Yeah. 38, you know, 24 nothing, 31 nothing, 38 nothing. And it wasn't enough. It mm -hmm. was keep going. And that's a that's the mindset, Vince, that we it. talked about that wasn't <clears throat> there the week before. Yeah. Yep. And so, again, we can hammer Brian Kelly for the things that he does wrong, and I will. You know I will. But when he, when he, when he, when we criticize him for something and then he goes out and corrects it, that's great because that's how you get better. And, look, I would much rather be peak as much as I'm frustrated by what we saw in September and on October 2nd against Cincinnati, I'd much rather be peaking now than oh, in yeah. September. Absolutely. Like, I would much rather be doing this than to reverse – the outcomes you just dominate your teams in September yeah. and you're playing bad teams. And then now you just lost to Cincinnati a week ago and now you've got to go play Virginia tech. Right. I would much rather, rather be the other way around. And yeah. and to me, that's the encouraging thing is yes, we, we could, we're, we'll have the whole off season to talk about why they did or didn't do this and when and how sure. and why and whatever. But the reality is they're making the changes and it's starting to really pay off. So 
this weekend is before we dive into that matchup, we're going to find out was last week a one off or is this truly this offense turning the corner to say, hey, you know, Brian Kelly said it the week before you got to score points, right? OK, this has been known. I don't care if it took him too long to figure it out. I'm just glad he figured it out. Yeah, absolutely. But if he did. But that's the thing we're going to find out if he, if, and, if he did. And and he 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 did say and uh, and again and we've talked about this before. I don't I don't necessarily take everything that Brian Kelly says in his press conferences, you know, as gospel. Okay, but he did say, hey, look, Tommy and I had a conversation where we wanted to continue to run right. the offense. Okay, so it was a conscious decision to continue yeah. to run the offense. Which, hey, that's a step in the right direction. The only I time care. I care what Brian Kelly has to say is when it's backed <laughs> up by. Action. What's on the field? Yeah, absolutely. And he was talking then about something matters. that happened in the past. That's right. Which was, you know, he was just. Explaining we can, but we can stuff. go back and look at it and say, yeah, okay, yeah, they did exactly. that. Now, now, did it work? No, <clears throat> they only scored three points points on offense in the second half. That's true, but that's not the point. That's not, it's the, not point the point at point. all. It's not the execution yeah. that'll come. You had a bunch of kids. Right. You had, you know, you had Tyler Buckner in there, and you had freshman offensive line who never played. You had young receivers. You had some guys that never been in there. They didn't execute real well. It was great experience for them. But it's not about the execution. It's about the mindset. It's the same thing we said about Virginia in the second quarter. It's not that they didn't score mm -hmm. that bothered me. It's that they didn't even try. Right. If they would have taken some shots and maybe, you know, you know, the first run, the first two runs I understood, you know, you're backed up at your own 15. Let's see if we get some distance. Well, Chris Tyree and two carries had him, got him a first down, got him out near the third yard line. It's time to go. You got two timeouts. Yeah. Let's, let's go. That to me is the mindset, and then of course we saw that mindset carry on into the second half, where the team realized, "Hey, we it's, it's over, we got this." Yeah, we didn't see that against Georgia Tech on both sides of the ball. No matter who was in the game, it was attack, it was yep. go, it was keep Same going. Same game plan throughout. And that's what I'm talking about. Even though yeah. they only scored three more points against Georgia Tech than they did against Virginia, right? That's it, three more points. But it's the principle, it's the mindset, it's the philosophy behind. This is this is our DNA. Our DNA is to never back down, never quit, never stop fighting. And I don't care what the score is. You play like this drive is the most important of the season, right? I mean, that's yeah. hyperbolic, but the point the point stands is you don't look at the scoreboard. It's about the standard. And it, the standard is the same whether you're up 45 to nothing or down 45 to nothing. That's what it, it well, excited me. And I, and I will and I will kind of reiterate what you said last night. That's why we can tell the difference between a 35 point win that was just uh, your guys are better than their guys kind of thing or a 35 point win where, OK, things are really clicking. Things are, you know, we like where things are moving. We like what what they're they're calling on offense and the way that they're going about it. And so it's not all about points in the end zone. I mean, that's all important. Don't get me wrong. You still want to win the game, but mm -hmm. it's about how they're going about it. And, and I think that that's super important. And, yeah. and that's why. And that's why people come to Irish Breakdown because we're going to tell you what we're seeing, <laughs> right? And, and whether we're happy or not, right? I mean, that, that from a coach's standpoint, right? Right. Now, how does this translate into the Stanford matchup? And that's ultimately what this comes down to, no doubt. Is you've got to make sure games like this are some of the most challenging, in my opinion, because as we've said to you before, it's hard. You can't lie to kids. Right. right, especially veterans. And this is not as young of a team as people make it out to be. You've got a fifth year senior quarterback, you've got a junior running back, you've got senior starting outside receivers, you've got four three seniors or or older in your offensive line, you've got old defensive, right? This isn't a young team. There are they're young in spots, but they're not a young team. And the reason I'm saying that is not to push back on Brian Kelly, it's to say you can't lie to veterans. They know right. when a team sucks. They're gonna know that Stanford sucks. You've got Thanksgiving on Thursday. You've got a trip to California on Friday. California is not an easy place to maneuver around in, from what I understand. You're playing an opponent that doesn't that's in a good, and you're going to play in a stadium that's not probably not going to be full. Yeah, it's good or point. close to full. I mean, it's a good point. You're going to need forty thousand Notre Dame fans there for it to be full. I watched mm -hmm. the Utah game again today, and like the whole end zone is empty. Yeah, I mean empty. And I wouldn't want to go watch that Stanford team. Every no, week either. I'm well, just and it's even harder to do it now. I mean, it's, look, it's harder to go to a college football game in California. than is in Indiana. I'm not well, trying to get into politics. I'm just, it's just reality. That's a, it's that's just, just it's harder. Yeah, and so if I got to jump through hurdles to go watch a team that sucks and they don't have a real strong fan base to begin with. Yeah. Right. I get it. So there's just not going to be that energy 
that you're you, – I just had someone send me a text that they're actually going to fly to Stanford on Thursday after Thanksgiving dinner, which is really smart in my opinion. Give them a whole day to get their legs back underneath them. That's a really smart idea, so I'm glad to hear that. So the point is these kids aren't stupid. They're smart. They know Stanford stinks. So how do you – and you've got Thanksgiving. So how do you keep them focused and locked in, right? That's going to be the challenge for Notre Dame, especially on this side of the ball. Because this matchup between the offense and their defense, this is an abysmal, abysmal Stanford defense mm-hmm. we're going to get into. So, so we're going to learn a lot about the, the, this is why I say this game is so important. Because if Tommy Reese and Brian Kelly and Lance Taylor and, and Coach Quinn and Coach Alexander and Coach Taylor and Coach McNulty can keep these kids locked in and keep this energy and this emotion going against a team that they know sucks, then yeah. it's telling me, they're playing more for themselves than they are focusing on Stanford. And that's a good thing. That's not that's like selfishness. That's what yeah. that's what Bama does. Bama doesn't play for you. They don't play because of the opponent. They play to the Alabama standard. That's what's expected of them, regardless of who's on the other side of the field, whether it's New Mexico State or Georgia. Right. That's why Nick Saban is great. Not because he has great players. The great players are a byproduct of the process. Okay. Sure. So – that's what we're going to learn is if that's to me that turn in the corner thing, because Vince, I'm going to pull these numbers up. <laughs> Let's start with this run game matchup between Notre Dame and Stanford. Okay. The Notre Dame rushing offense against the Stanford rush defense. And look, we're the, the Notre Dame run offense is not vintage Notre Dame run offense. Okay. They're, they're still in the 60s, 70s, and there's an 80 right there as well. Mm-hmm. Th- th- this is not, uh, you know, your your dad's rush offense from Notre mm-hmm. Dame. Okay. So th- I think that is very important when you're looking at these numbers. And everybody in the chat knows that. They know that this isn't a, a, a vintage Notre Dame run team. But the, I can tell you right now, Stanford would kill to have the numbers that Notre Dame has right now. And, mm-hmm. and when you look at Stanford's numbers, there's only 130 teams, as a reminder to everybody out there. That's the, the lowest you can be is 130. And every one of these numbers is in the 120s. <laughs> so, I mean. And heading in the wrong direction. Holy moly. It's really bad. I mean, and, and the thing about it is, Vince, is it's gotten worse as, I mean, but it's been, it's gotten worse as the season's gone on. Sure. But they've been bad all year. And we, we had this the other day. I'll read it again. From the first game to the last game, this is what Stanford's rush defense has done. 200 yards allowed, 185, 247 to Vanderbilt, 204, 228, 255, 100 against Washington State, 229, 441, and and Utah, I believe, had over 300 at halftime. They ended up with 441. 218. And then last week, 352 to Cal. Mm. Yards per carry, 6.5-5-6-5-6-3-9-4-2-5-8-3-7-5-5-9-6-4-3 and 10-4. Mm. Uh, they've given up at least two rushing touchdowns in all but two games. In the last three games, they've given up 12 rushing touchdowns. They are they are bad. And and the thing about it is Vince when you watch the film, they're consistently out leveraged. They are consistently pushed around up front and they don't tackle well. I mean it's it's a combination yeah. of multiple factors and and this is the, this is one of the least athletic power 5 defenses you will find. Right. Yep. They're I mean, they, slow, they, they're just slow yes. to the football. I mean, you know, we yeah. talk about Notre Dame being so good defensively at rallying to the football on the perimeter. You're, you're just not going to see that uh, mm-hmm. in, in this game. They're just they're they're a step slow across the board. And mm-hmm. when you're a step slow and you're playing a team w- that is as good as Notre Dame, and I'll say it as good as they are offensively, especially against a team like this, yeah. it's going to make a huge difference. Yeah. Vince, this is this is a situation where. One of the things that, that that was overlooked about Stanford during their glory years under Harbaugh and then, of mm-hmm. course, the, the great stretch that Coach Shaw had, they were always sneaky good in the secondary. And, and they were always really tough and physical at linebacker. Yeah, They're still tough and physical at linebacker. They're just not as talented as they've been at linebacker. And their secondary is really just not good. Now, their front four, their front three was decent early. But 
outside of Thomas Booker, they just get chubbed around. And that's really going to be the key for Notre Dame in this game is Thomas Booker, the recruit Knicks are going to know that name. He was a kid that Stanford beat Notre Dame for. He's a good football player. You know, he's an NFL caliber guy, not a high NFL draft pick, but he's an NFL guy. Somebody that get paid on yeah, Sundays. He's yeah. big and strong. So you have to have a plan to, to for Thomas Booker. But outside of him, I mean, the rest of that defensive line, they just push the guys around. I mean, I'm watching Utah and I'm watching even UCLA and and, and I'm watching Cal just push them three, four yards off yeah. the ball. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was like it was kind of sad. You know, to, it, it was like watching like a, a professional athlete that hung around like three years too long. Better yet, you know, boxing. You know, you get these boxers <laughs> that used to be great fighters that are still fighting in their 40s and 50s. And you just watching this, it's just like, it's just sad to see yeah. this once great fighter just collecting a paycheck while some bum beats him up. Right. You know, yep. and, and that's how I feel when I watch Stanford. You know, I had, I had a lot of respect for what Stanford did. Now I watch him and it's just like, ugh, ugh, ugh. Like they're just bad. Yeah. And, you know, but so, so now here's, here's why, what I want to see, Vince. Two, two things. Number one, Notre Dame needs to have success running the football. That's of course. fine. Yeah. That's fine. Here's the risk, though. I know. I, uh, if I, you're going to say what I think you're going to say, go, go. My, go. My, my fear, my fear of this game is that, and my, and it was my fear going into Georgia Tech, too. And I think I audibleized it in one of the shows. My fear is that Notre Dame's going to see these numbers too, and they're going to be like, "Man, let's just go twelve personnel, pound it down their throat." Yep, and they're not going to be able to stop us. Yep. And you know what? The answer is you're right. They're not going to be able to stop you, but, but it doesn't make you a better team. Exactly, and it does not get you ready for whatever your next right. game is going to be. Right, because you're not going to be Georgia game, that way. Right. Yeah, that next game is either going to be against Georgia or you know, or somebody in the college football because playoff. That's the mindset, though. Yes. That right there, Vince. Right. Notre Dame has to say, "We if if things go our way, we're getting Georgia." Right. In the first round. That's absolutely the mindset. That's how you're saying. So how can we prepare ourselves <laughs> or or if things go our way, but a little not so good for some other teams, we're getting Ohio State. Yeah. Either, Either way, way <laughs> our offense has to be something that it's not yeah. in 12 and 13 personnel. Exactly. And now, that doesn't mean I don't want to see 12 personnel. It wasn't 12 personnel so much. I mean, we saw them yeah. take some big shots. At it. It's that, 12 yeah. personnel and just pound the Right. Ball. Right. Exactly. And, and that's what now it it'd probably work against Stanford. But it again, it doesn't make right. you better. Exactly. And that's the danger. So continue to get your yards, but get it from running the offense the way that you have for the last month, which right. is tempo, speed, spread the field, stretch them out, create run lanes and holes for your offensive for your running back to then mm -hmm. go make plays. Keep being who you are and building on who you are. Don't get and this isn't a this isn't a concern for Notre Dame specifically. This is always my concern when you're playing a team this bad. And it was a concern when I coached. I don't know if you ever saw offenses like defenses like this, but you kind of run into this, hey, I know we can just line up and pound these guys. Let's go out there and pound them, puff right. our stats up, and get a big W. But then it doesn't make you better for the next week, and that's the key. That's 100% and, and, the key. And so yeah. that's what you want to see from Coach Reese is, hey, keep that pedal to the metal, man, because you're not building your team to beat Stanford. Right. You're building your team to beat Georgia and Ohio yes. State and Cincinnati or Alabama or Oklahoma State or whoever you might get in the college football playoff or one of those teams in a New Year's Six Bowl. Right, because this right? is your last tune-up. I mean, this is your last opportunity to go up against somebody who is not your team, right? This is your last chance for a month. Right. No matter what bowl you're playing in, this is your last chance for a month so right. you need to make yourself better, and you need to get ready for whoever. Because even if it's a New Year's Six Bowl, you're going to be playing a team that's better than Stanford. Okay, right. and, and in order to win that game, you've got to you've got to. Run. I know, there, I know. There's not a bowl they're going to play in where that team's not going to be better than Stanford. Right, exactly. So the goal just, isn't to beat Stanford. That will be all part and parcel with you doing what you do. The win will take care of itself. Don't worry right. about that. Okay. Again, right. you're not scheming to beat Stanford. Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -mm. You are you are not scheming to beat anybody. You're scheming to make yourself play the way Notre Dame. It's plays. about your identity. Yes. And Notre Dame has finally established an identity with this football team that works. 
And now this game is about is about tattooing that thing on your chest. Yes. Right? Absolutely. You've been coming up with the design. You have it written out. Now it's time to take it to the tattoo artist and put it, have them put it right there on your chest, right over, right here over your heart, right here. Yep. Bam. That's who you are. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that's how it works. I don't have any tattoos, you know, <laughs> so I'm assuming that's how it works. <laughs> I don't need uh, I don't know. But that's that's where I'm coming from, Vince. It's about you've worked to get here. You've worked to kind of finally say, hey, we've, we've gotten to the point where we really feel good about who we are. Now it's don't take a step back, take a step, another step forward and just cement it like this is your DNA now. And and again, it could be they score 38 points at half by the halftime or 31 points by halftime. And they only score, you know, 14 in the second half with your backups. That's not it's not the point. Right. It's about it's about continue to establish your identity and earning a, a really convincing win. That to me. Yes. Is 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 so so important to this game, and this is the matchup right here that concerns me with that yeah. because you can make it can get really easy to just come out and say, "Hey, um, let's just let's just let's just go get this dub and go home." Because that's the that's that's the I don't want I don't want to use the word lazy because that's not what I mean, but like that's the easy go to like well. I mean, look at these numbers, guys. I mean, we can line up and we can just pound them and it doesn't matter. And we'll just, uh, you know, blow them off the field. And it doesn't matter. Run the clock, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's the old mentality. That's not the mentality I want to see on Saturday night. Mm-hmm. Are you before, laughing at your tattoo request? Be, before we put it, we move on to the past <laughs> game. Rick Doyle says, Brian, you should get body on a body tattooed on your chest. <laughs> I don't know if anyone that doesn't listen to this show would take that the right way. <laughs> that sounds like something a dude that's just waiting to get sent to prison. Yeah. His chest, <laughs> down his chest. You'd be so. getting some interesting uh, conversations at the beach. Let's just yes. put it that way. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, goodness gracious. All right. So, so again, this is a matchup that to me – and here's something else I want to see from this game, Vince – a guy that we've been very critical of this year, and rightfully so, that is coming off of a very good performance is Kane Madden. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I need to see him and Josh Lug finish the season off on a strong note. Right. That's something that I need to see. If he can put two – again, mm-hmm. Stanford's going to present a little different matchup than Georgia Tech did because Stanford's front three are are, are not good, but they're at least big. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so if Notre Dame can kind of come off and get some movement on them the way they did Georgia Tech, that's also going to be a good sign. Because, again, you need to stay who you are. Tempo, get the ball outside, you know, mm-hmm. spread the field, be who you are. But that doesn't mean you can't do that and move people. Right. And that's, you know, because right now it's still been body on a body. Right. It's still been that all season. But if you can be body on a body with some push, then it gets right. real interesting exactly. on what this offense can be. So that's another part of this. It's it's look, they're going to get their yards. It's right. just going to happen. But are they getting their yards because they're just way better than Stanford? They getting their yards because again they're building on what they're doing. That's the final piece of this that Vince. That to me, I, I really am curious to see in this matchup. Yep. So there we go. Pass game matchup. This is an interesting one too, Vince, because I think Stanford's pass defense looks a lot better than it actually is because of just how bad their rush defense has been. <laughs> it's like teams haven't really needed to throw the ball on them, and right. there's not a lot of great passing teams in the Pac-12, if we're being honest. That's very uh, true. It's it's a it's a conference that's become very much a a pass oriented league, and or excuse me, run oriented league. And so there's there's not a lot of really good throwing teams. Their secondary is not good. And you know, like like I said, they they've you know, like Utah only threw for 140 yards on them. Well, when you run for almost 500 yards, you you don't need to throw on somebody, right? You know, Washington only threw for 146 because Washington's pass offense is terrible. So I, I think when you look at it, those are the things that kind of factor into it to me. That say this is this pass numbers are 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 little a little better than their actual talent mm-hmm. in my opinion. And I, I think when you kind of get down to pass efficiency defense, you see it a little bit more clear completion percentage becomes a little bit more clear yards per attempt. It becomes a little bit more clear, you know? So, so those are the numbers that I look at the, the, the 30th and yards per game is misleading. It's kind of like you guys talked about the Notre Dame defense yesterday. It's the exact opposite argument. Notre Dame doesn't rank real high in passing yards allowed, partly because of a couple games here and there, but also because 
teams haven't been able to run the ball effectively on Notre Dame. So and, they've, and they're trying to come back. And so a lot exactly. of times you do that through the air, not but, on the ground. Right. But yards per attempt, yards per completion, uh, rate, mm-hmm. uh, uh, passer, you know, defensive passer rating, those numbers, Notre Dame ranks in the top 25. And those numbers to me are more indicative of than just total yards because there's all types of factors. So when you look at those numbers, Vince, it's not, it's not, it, they're not real strong. Now they've got some length and some size in the secondary corner. Again, it, it's the same matchup. It, it, they just, they have an overall lack of speed, right? That that's the concern. And Cal had the last two opponents have thrown the ball pretty well on them. Uh, Oregon state went for two fifty seven, completed 67, 76% of their passes Cal's offense threw for 276, completed 66% of their, their passes against them. So the last two teams who, who do throw the ball a little bit more had a decent amount of success. And keep in mind, Cal was coming off of a game against Arizona. They threw for 94 yards. <laughs> but they have a they have a they have a decent pass attack, you know. Yeah. And, and and so Chase Garber's solid player, nice player, but I mean, you know, he of, had a lot of success last week. Yeah, I was going to say the quarterback for for Cal uh, was kind of a dual threat. I mean, the kid can run the ball, he can throw the ball. He's he's just kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. Like that's kind of the the thought I got he's about. Just a him. nice college yeah, quarterback, right? exactly. Competitive yeah. kid. They're yeah. better when he's in there. That kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No question. Agreed. Yeah. So what they don't have is the weapons that Notre Dame has, and and, and this is again why it's important to me that Notre Dame makes sure that their pass offense still becomes a key aspect of what they're trying to do because you're still trying to build some of these weapons into a regular part of who you are, right? You're still trying to get Lorenzo Styles going. You're still trying to get Deion Colsey going. I mean, if it was me, I would honestly, that would be something that I would want to have as part of this game plan is let's really make sure that Lorenzo and Braden Lindsay get touches early, assuming Braden plays, and let's make sure that Dion gets work, not just snaps, but work. And he's got a pass here, pass there. And when he gets the ball, he does some good things. Right. I would, especially when if, if you're able to get a big lead and you put Tyler Buckner in the game, I would do some things with him and Dion, take some shots to let Dion get a one on one down the field, let sure. Dion get those opportunities because you're going to, you could need him in the postseason. I mean, and he's part of your rotation now. Yep. You know, what if Kevin Austin goes down and what, you know, you're going to need Dion. This would be a great chance to kind of get him going. Same with get Lorenzo. His confidence up. Yeah. yeah. I would throw a couple balls to George Takis, you know, just really get your whole repertoire going. Absolutely. Because you're really starting to see this Notre Dame offense become a really effective thing. And what I love so much about last week's game plan is twofold. Number one, Jack Cohn did a great job of just t- reading the defense out and going where the open guy was. Number yeah. one, mm-hmm. part of the reason that works so well, like a lot of times we say, well, you know, quarterback did a great job of spreading the ball around. Well, what I liked so much about last week was that was true, but the game plan was clearly designed to f- feature different guys at different times, right? There were plays called for Braden Lindsay. There were plays called that were clearly designed with Kevin Austin as the number one read first play of the game. Your goal on that play is to open up the deep drag to Kevin Austin. That's no the question. route you want. No question. And that's the route that came open. There were clearly plays for Michael Mayer. There were clearly plays for Logan Diggs and Kyron Williams and Chris Tyree. And, and they were clearly designing plays to get the ball to different people. That was just, That's what I love so much about it. Because if you know this play caller – Hey, I'm gonna dial up Michael Mayer this play, but I may dial. It's hard for you as a defensive coordinator to say, "Okay, who am I focusing on?" Okay, I'm gonna shut down Card Williams and Chris Ty- and Michael Mayer. Tom Maurice is like, "That's all good. I, I got plenty of stuff in my back pocket for Kevin Austin, right. and Braden Lindsey, and and, and that's Lorenzo what we wanted Stiles. in the summer. Because right. We talked about the fact that, and, and I realize some guys have gotten hurt, you know, uh, with with Davis, et cetera. But they, you know, I think I counted six or seven guys that they could go to that I would be comfortable having them go to and it's impossible for a defense to take away six or seven different guys so but that's what we're finally now seeing we're we're finally seeing them get those guys involved uh in in a uh a a very directed situation you know what Mm -hmm. i mean like it's it's very pointed and it's very obvious that they're getting everybody involved and and man i just 
I'll be selfish and I'll say that I wish this was being done from the beginning of the season mm -hmm. because I think this offense just could have been unbelievable. And and we'll have, been, they'll have the whole yeah. off season to talk about that. But I know it's getting there now. Yeah, no, that yeah, was, hey, if I had key. to choose, it's definitely this route I would have taken as opposed, you know, having them do it now, as opposed to them giving it a shot in the first half and feeling like they didn't do it well enough. And then got kind of going into a shell and be like, well, we got to run the ball. Every, they know. did. Yeah, right. Which, <laughs> I'm very happy that it's now, right? Mm -hmm. That that's I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. So that's you know you look at this matchup. Notre Dame is not great anywhere when it comes to offensive statistics in the pass game. I think the most misleading stat on there for me so far is sacks, simply because they were so bad, so bad in the first half of the year giving up sacks. Right. They've been a much better pass protection team the last five games, in my opinion. And they have. Now, they aren't facing they haven't faced any good pass rushers, but that's not changing Saturday. <laughs> like, <that's> the, <laughs> we we worry about that in the postseason, right? But that's not changing Saturday. Stanford's just Stanford's not a real good and they've never been a great pass rushing team schematically. They've always relied on, you know, back in the early 2010s when they had some really good edge rushers, you know, just individual edge rushers. They don't have those. Gabe Reed is not that. He's a nice, tough, high motor kid. He, he he could give you some problems if if you know if if you don't play well or you're not sure. in your technique, you're not locked in, you're not focused, all those kind of things. But it, it you know it's a situation where you should be able to shut them down. Mm -hmm. So as long as they can protect Jack Cohn and the game plan is good and diverse and multiple and keep doing the the thing. Don't just come out and say, hey, we're going to run four verts all day because they suck, right. right? It's the same thing right. in the pass game, right? Scheme them up. Scheme <clears> them up <throat> like this is vintage Stanford 2012. Right. That's how Tommy, Tommy Reese needs to look at this Stanford team and treat them like it's the Stanford teams he played against. Yeah. Because when Tommy Reese is at <clears> Notre <throat> Dame, these Stanford defenses were excellent. And that's what I want to see. It, do that. And then if they stink, then you hang 40 on them again in the first half and you call it a day. Right. With your starters, you put your backups in, and you let them run the offense. That's what. That's what. Yeah. And and I think that you know this team is not very good at penetrating, <clears throat> uh, you know, getting into the backfield, etc. Um, and so I think that opens up all kinds of possibilities, you know, motion wise, and 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 you know, action in the backfield, things of that nature, end arounds, all those different things that we've kind of seen some hints of moving, you know, in the past couple of games. I think it opens up a lot of opportunity because they just do not get up the field very quickly mm -hmm. um, as a front. This is a really unathletic Stanford defense. <clears throat> right, exactly. And we're going to continue to reiterate that. Yeah. Vince, let's move on to the final pass aspect of this matchup, but it's not any prettier for Stanford. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, no, it's not. It, it, it you know, they're they're <clears throat> just there's nothing they're good at on defense. I mean, that that's the thing, is usually even even like Georgia Tech, there were some things that you know I liked about Georgia Tech. You know, they, you know they're okay here, and, and they do a nice job with this. Or at least they have some talent there. Hmm. This is a this is a back group. I mean, hmm. yards per game, points per game, and the thing about it is, is it's been it's been steady. It's not like they had two games where they gave up sixty points and that right. padded their stats. I mean, it's. 24, 28, 23, 35, 24, 28, 34, 20, 52, 35, 41. They've yet to hold a team under 20 points all year, and the team that scored 20 was Washington, who is terrible on offense. You know, and and, and that's the – I mean, Washington's averaging 22.3 points per game. 22.3 points per game. Mm. And that was a team that, that Stanford held to the lowest total, which is 20. And they almost hit their average. <laughs> Right, and they are terrible. <laughs> yeah, you know, so they're, <laughs> they're just they're just not good average. on defense. They've been consistently not good. Yeah, and that's the thing is this is an opportunity for Notre Dame to really go out and lay the wood on them. Mm -hmm. And because there's a lot of people saying that Utah is one of the hottest teams in the country, and they are right now. Sure, Utah played them three weeks ago and put an absolute beat down on them. I mean, that's the thing is Notre Dame is getting an opportunity in these last couple of games to play bad teams. But to then have measuring a recent measuring sticks against other teams that the committee perceives to be hot teams, right? Absolutely, Utah obviously is one of them. And so for me, Vince, when I when I look at this, I say, okay, well, how are you going to, you know, how, not that Notre Dame doesn't need to be worried about Utah, 
This right. is more us as analysts looking at this. Correct. Right. It, it's data points, right? We're, we're, right. we're looking at ways to compare right. teams and, and things of that nature. Yeah. Right. So this isn't saying that, that they need to worry about Utah. It's more of just the reality of the fact that they have that recent game. Plus you have Georgia, Georgia Tech playing exactly. this weekend. Yep. And, and so to me, you know, Utah's jumped all the way from like unranked two weeks ago to 19. The committee yeah. clearly likes what they're saying from Utah. And so now you're in a situation where it's like, okay, well, now it's your turn to go do that. And that's what Notre Dame needs to do offensively. And and if they Mm -hmm. can – and here's the thing. We're going to get into keys to the game. So we're going to record a podcast tonight. Uh, Actually, Vince and I are going to talk about this, uh, what we may do. We'll get, but we'll have a show. We'll have a predictions. I'm not going to bring it up because then if we don't do it, then they're going to know you're the yeah, one that's that, there. that said we weren't going to, didn't want, couldn't do wow. it. So well, I'm, 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 I'm looking joking. out for you. I'm joking, man. I could just throw you. Oh, oh you know, fault. fine. Screw it. I'm throwing one of the bus here. No. Uh, I'm kidding. So we're going to have our, our matchups and prediction show, whether that's mm. tonight or tomorrow. We'll let you know. So that's why you need to be subscribed and hit the notification bell. Just saying. Bingo. Uh, but. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get into sort of the the final score and all that kind of stuff. But I like the Notre Dame defense in this game. But I'm going to tell you something right now. If the Notre Dame offense can really come out and jump all over Stanford, it yeah. makes it so much easier for the Notre Dame defense. Always. To really yeah. attack and, and force mistakes. Because they don't feel like they if they make a mistake, it's going to be a huge problem. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. have to be able to play fearless. Like right. that, that, okay, if we take a chance here and it doesn't pay off, well, the offense still has our back. We still got right. a huge lead. It doesn't necessarily And Stanford matter. doesn't have a lot of playmakers or receiver. They have a lot of right. big guys that can win the one-on-one back sure. shoulders and stuff. They don't have a like they don't have that guy that you throw a slant to and you're like, uh oh. <laughs> you know, so I think that gives you even more reason to be aggressive. Don't let them nickel and dime you because that's what they want to do. Right. They want to run their pro style West Coast offense and, and they're you know, crazy, run their wide banana. And, yeah. Oh, man, those are so and they and and so to me it's about that quarterback cannot move. If he can sit in the pocket and start start throwing dimes, and, and he'll do that, right? Sure. If Tanner McKee gets time to throw, he's going to throw some dimes, you know. And and he's a young, he's you know he's young, his ball placement, he's working all that, but he's got talent. He's got a good arm. He's got a big pro style body. Don't ever let him get comfortable. The best way to make him uncomfortable is for the offense to put twenty one on the board in the first quarter, or you know first three possessions. Yeah, right. I mean, whether that's possession. first quarter, or yeah. second quarter, or whatever. You can't score twenty one points if you don't get more than three possessions right true but the point is just score go out and score put it in the end zone that's going to be the key for me because that's the one piece that's still not quite there yet for notre dame we saw it against virginia right early in the game they had to settle for the fourth down that they did not get they went forward on fourth down the second time they were able to get it but you're you're not going to you don't want to rely on having to convert fourth downs early in games against georgia and ohio state teams like that right so there are still parts of this offense that need to improve. And that's where we're going to learn a lot about Tommy Reese's maturity as a coach. And when I mean maturity, I don't mean like a lack of maturity as a person. I just mean like growing into the job Yeah, yeah. is being able to see your team win 55 to nothing and 28 to three and still say that was great, but we weren't good here. We got to get better there. That's what the great coaches do is they don't look at 55 nothing. They say, right, why are we still not putting it in the end zone every time we're in the red zone? Because a lot of these numbers have gone up in the last month. The red zone numbers have not really gone up. They haven't, they've they've been hitting more big plays. That's why Notre Dame is scoring more points. They're hitting more big plays. True. And, and so so that's something to work Coach Reese's look at and say, hey, look, let's, you know, those are the things we need to still focus on. And that's what the good coaches do is they don't. They don't get wrapped up in here's what our points per game are and here's what I – it's are we playing to our potential as a football team? And then the the scary thing is the Notre Dame offense still isn't playing to its full potential. It's getting way closer. Way closer. But there's yeah. just – I mean, third down could stand to get a little bit better. It's been getting yeah. better. They've been over 50% the last four games. That's, yeah. that's good. That's real yeah. good. On the season, not good. I mean, right. it's okay. I mean, you're right. 49th, but 42-4 well, is not where 40, I am. 42-4, when you consider that they've been over 50% the last four games, I think they're like 26-42. Right. and 42. Yeah. 24-46 and 46 the last two games is just a shade over 50%. Just, just for context purposes, a shade over 50% gets you, I believe, into the top 10 in third yeah. down offense. Let me just yeah. look real quick. Yeah, the n- number five team in the country is 50.8. And Notre Dame, the last four games, is 24 for 46, which comes out to 
52.2, that would make them the number four third down yeah. offense in the country. So the last right. four games been great. Yes. Keep exactly. it going. Yes. Right? Red zone offense, you got to get better. So I think those are the things that I'm, I'm looking to see from this game is because it's, again, it's not about the team in red because they are awful. It's about the team in white and gold and blue. Let me rephrase. The team in white and blue and gold and mustard. Uh, that's the team that you need to focus on and say, it's about us. What are we doing? That's what the coaches need to be thinking about is I don't care if we beat them 42 to seven. If you didn't feel like you played to a standard, you don't rip them. I'm not saying that, but you say, fellas, you know, look, yeah, it's nice, but they suck. We got to play better that, you know, and, and, and to me, that can be used in a way to say, Hey, that's really motivate you. Hey, you guys think that you're all happy. We scored 55 on Georgia tech. We scored 52 on, on Stanford fellas. We can be better, absolutely, and just continue to raise the bar. And that just—I mean—that can—that can create a lot of confidence. And that's what I want to see from this game, Vince. No doubt. So, any any final thoughts on this this particular matchup? No, I think you nailed it. Notre Dame just has to play to their standard, and they have to continue to build off what they did against Georgia Tech. Because I, I haven't been happier after a game like I ha- I was after Georgia Tech. Um, and that's what I what we need to see. Because look, Stanford's worse than Georgia Tech in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked what would happen if Stanford played Georgia Tech this weekend. Mm -hmm. I think Georgia Tech wins. And I'm not so sure it's all that close, to be honest with you, because I think Georgia Tech has a couple of offensive playmakers that Stanford wouldn't have an answer for. Yeah. Um, And so that, that I would say it's a double digit win for, you know, low double digits, 10, 14 point win by Georgia Tech against Stanford. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my opinion. But um, so, yeah, you need to go out and you need to handle your business you need to play to the Notre Dame standard if you do that and you continue to build on what you did offensively and defensively against, uh, you know, Georgia Tech and what we've seen the last four games. And then I'm going to be happy again. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be real excited about, you know, the next four weeks of shows that we do. I'm going to be a pretty positive guy, uh, you know, leading into wherever they're going to end up, you know, in the bowl season. So mm-hmm. uh, but we need to see it. I, I need to see them build on it. Got a couple super chats, Vince, I want to get yes, to before we, we get out of here. We got one from ben, ben Elijah. Ben, thank you for the super chat. He says, who do you think would have an easier time, Notre Dame's offense against Georgia's defense or Georgia's offense against Notre Dame's defense? That is a great question. That is a really and good that's, question. Ben, that's why hmm. I'm not as concerned about Georgia as I am about Ohio State, for example. And, and the reason I and that's why I've never bought into the Georgia hype. Now, if they go out and beat Bama, okay, you know, look, Georgia's great. This is a re, this is definitely one of the two or three best teams of college football for 2021. And for most of the season, they've been clearly the best team. I think Ohio State right now is playing for the last month there. has been the best. That last two three weeks has been the best team in the country. But for the whole season, <clears> start <throat> to finish, it's been it's been Georgia. I've got my concerns about who they've played, and all, but they've sure. done what they need to do against bad teams. They're beating them all convincingly. Sure. I don't think Georgia's had a close game all year, but they have not played anybody in the same universe as Notre Dame or Bama, and that's why we're going to learn a lot about them when they play Bama in the title game. That's the one thing that makes me real nervous about Notre Dame's playoff chances. Right. Is if I'm right on Georgia, Bama's going to beat them. And then now it's like, uh-oh, yeah, now you need Cincinnati to lose yeah. or Ohio State to lose or Michigan if, to lose. If and Bama wins, little... I Notre Dame's going I, into year six. That that's yeah. that's my I hate to boil it down to one game yeah. because other things can affect it, but I right. just feel like the way I feel like the whole cosmos is working, I, I just feel like they're if not Alabama, dropping Georgia out. Yeah. If they lose. And no, when, again, as I said I yesterday, so. unless it's a blowout. Right. That's right. be the only and but I don't see that happening. Yeah. So that, that's that's where I'm coming from, but I, I that's a matchup that I would not be afraid of. That doesn't mean Notre Dame's going to win or beat Georgia. Or Georgia stinks. It's just that's a matchup. To your point, I don't I don't think Georgia matches up super great against Notre Dame's defense. Everybody keeps focusing on how's Notre Dame's offensive line going to handle Georgia. Well, can Georgia move the ball on Notre Dame? I don't think that's a given. Right. They haven't the first two times they played Notre Dame, and they didn't move the right. ball all that great on Marcus Freeman's defense last year either. And, and so I just – I would welcome that matchup in the first round. I really would. And I could be nuts and they could end up beating Notre Dame by 40 if that happens and I'm going to look like an idiot. But I just – I have not been – I have not been blown away by Georgia relative to the perceived best teams of past years. They're not Bama from last year. They're not LSU from 2019. They're not Clemson from 2018. I don't even think they're Georgia from 2017, to be honest with you. 
And I thought Georgia that year was the best team in the country. If they had a better head coach, I think they'd have beat Bam in the title game. They just got outcoached. And that's and that's kind of been the, the that's the thing that's happened every time they've played Bama. It's just the one team has a better coach. I think is what it boils down to. We also got one from your guy Connor Patton down here. Let me, go, let me go find it. Connor was the first person in the chat today, at least the first person to, to put anything in the chat today. Connor, thank you for super chat. He says, Last year Brian Kelly said, I'm tired of being Mr. Nice Guy. Please apply that sentiment to this. <laughs> no game. doubt about it. I wish Brian Kelly would put would use that sentiment all the time. I wish Brian Kelly would get so annoyed because you know, he's not going to get mad at the committee. He's not going to get mad at anyone else. The only people he gets mad at is the media, right? So I, I my, maybe that should be my new goal is to, yes, good, yes. <laughs> this guy. Uh, for someone who doesn't care what the media thinks, he sure gets real mad about what the media says. Yeah, exactly. And constantly reacts to things, even when he's not being questioned about things the media said. But maybe I can tick him off so much that he just goes out there and says, hey, I'm going to prove you wrong and just start doing what he should have been doing all along and, and coaching angry, you know, and that's fine by me. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, whatever. That, hey, whatever gets the job yeah. done, that's fine. Because I think Brian Kelly, I'll say this, Brian Kelly with an edge is going to impact the football team. Brian Kelly being pissed off all the time and not pissed off at his team, that's different, but just being pissed off at whoever else, me, media, somebody asks a dumb question in the press conference, the national media, whatever, I don't care. Well, but Brian Kelly's pissed off. He kind of has that Boston, you know, attitude, that Northeastern kind of chip on the shoulder that I think makes his team better. I, I do. Angry Brian Kelly is not – again, when I'm talking about angry, I'm talking about like at us, at me, at yeah. the media. Because I think I think he then starts kind of pushing his team and challenging his team and, yeah. and, and, and hey, I'm going to show you. I'm going to go hang a 45. Oh, you want to – yeah, you know, look, it's not a coincidence to me that Notre Dame did what they did in the first half against Georgia Tech after he was hammered for not getting style points against Virginia. Mm-hmm. Brian, 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 Brian Kelly says he doesn't care what the media thinks. He does. He absolutely does. I guarantee you that. That's okay. As long as it, you know, continue that. Don't do it as a one-off. Well, I showed you in this one game. Now it's back to normal. Uh, I, I hope he gets angry. I hope he I hope he looks at being ranked sixth and he's like, man, screw that. We're a top four team and we're gonna go show the world. I hope he does. I yeah. I like pissed off Brian Kelly. Absolutely. Because I think pissed off Brian Kelly makes the Notre Dame football team better. And again, when we're talking, we're not talking about Brian Kelly being pissed off yelling at his quarterback. We're talking right. about Brian Kelly being pissed off at outside sources or outside Correct. people or outside entities. That's when I think he's at his best. And that's when I think Notre Dame is at its best because, again, your football team is always going to be a reflection of your head coach, no matter how 100%. much you try otherwise. Your head coach and your leaders. And the leadership is there from a player standpoint. If Brian Kelly can continue to do what I think he's been doing recently, and even more so, meaning not taking the foot off the gas, right? then I think this team could be really dangerous. And, and if they beat Stanford the way they need to, we'll have a we'll have a show about this next week, about how this could be – the most dangerous Notre Dame team heading into the postseason, but they got to do it against Stanford. They've got to continue building against Stanford. You can't have that step back because if you take a step back, then it's like, well, it's just about the bad teams they played. Sure. You got to build on it. And that's going to yep. be the key. So that's it for our super chats, Vince. And that is going to do it for today's show. We are going to have, uh, we'll keep, keep an eye out on Twitter and on, on the notifications for when our next show is going to be. Uh, whether we record one tonight and play tomorrow or, or something else. And then of course, Friday, we'll be back at our normal time, 1230. We back at, 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 for, uh, for that. We'll have our mailbag. Now that's going to be a fun mailbag because we're also going to have some football games on that's while true. we're talking. So that'll be kind of fun. So we'll do mailbag. We'll kind of talk about the games that are on. It's going to be a lot of fun. Saturday post game show after the Stanford game. Obviously, it'll be me, and we'll figure out who my guest is going to be. And then we'll be back on Sunday night for our point yep. further review. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. If you're listening via podcast, give us a five star review. And of course, make my Thanksgiving happy by signing up for the Notre Dame mess- the Irish Breakdown message board. Right there. <laughs> on the bottom, boards.irishbreakdown.com. You can check that out. And, um, yeah, and, and and join us. So a lot more action coming up. We'll have a ton of action next week. 
we can't we cannot wait to do it all and we can't wait to have you all by our side as we do it so for vince i'm brian in case we don't talk to you again before tomorrow live have a wonderful happy thanksgiving i'm gonna go leave to do some more shopping i still have some more of your money i have to spend uh (laughs) for for families and in our community but just have a wonderful thanksgiving everyone stay safe enjoy the time with your family and thank you all so much for what you've done for us, what you've done for the South Bend and the Michiana community with the money that we raised and for, of course, helping the Irish Breakdown grow the way that it has. Last year on Thanksgiving, Vince, this wasn't even a thought. Nope. This, this YouTube channel wasn't really even a thought for us. Mm-mm. And now it's it's growing every day and thriving, and it's because of you all. And so I want to thank you all very, very much. Have a great, great, great rest of your day and a very happy Thanksgiving. And we will talk to you again very, very soon.